Good day, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to X Africa's latest webcast. My name is Kerry Leisha, and in today's presentation, I'm going to talk to you about supply chain disruption in Africa in 2020. To give you an idea of what I intend to talk about today, what I have up on the screen for you are the results from a survey the World Economic Forum ran a couple of years ago. In this survey, the institution asked supply chain professionals to indicate what they felt were the most prominent sources of supply chain disruption. The results were categorized into four broad buckets, namely environmental disruption, geopolitical disruption, economic disruption, and technological disruption. In today's presentation, what I want to do is focus on the first two sources, namely environmental disruption, because of course we had the arrival of the coronavirus pandemic this year, and secondly, geopolitical disruption, as we are primarily a country risk consultancy. In doing so, I'm going to touch on all the subcategories of disruption highlighted in red for you on the screen. And what is interesting here is that these are not mutually exclusive. As a result of an environmental disruption in the form of a pandemic, for example, you can have a shortage of labor or you can have extreme volatility in commodity prices, which we witnessed this year. Secondly, under a geopolitical disruption, you could have something like sudden demand shocks or border delays or ICT disruption. Let's begin by looking at our first source of supply chain disruption in 2020 in Africa. And that is, of course, the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic. Before looking at the impact of coronavirus on supply chains in Africa, let's just begin by looking at where we are in terms of the virus in Africa today. Now, the first case of COVID-19 in Africa was reported in Egypt on Valentine's Day. Fast forward four and a half months to where we are today on the 30th of June, and every single country in Africa is reporting coronavirus cases, as well as a rise in coronavirus cases. As of today, we have over 393,000 cases of the virus across the continent, and just short of 10,000 deaths. This is, of course, quite small for a population of 1.2 billion people, but Africa is very much representing one of the last waves of coronavirus at the global level. And we witnessed something similar with the SARS and the MERS virus a couple of years ago. For our purposes, what is most interesting is that we're starting to see a number of hotspots emerge, specifically in northern, south and western Africa. And most importantly, the countries with the highest concentration of cases are in fact your three largest economies in the continent. These are South Africa, Egypt and Nigeria. So turning our attention to how coronavirus impacted supply chains in Africa this year, what we need to do is take a high level view of this and look at how it impacted trade in general. And before we do so, what I want to do is make sure that we understand some fundamentals of African trade. First and foremost, I think it's important to note that trade as a percentage of GDP in Africa is actually quite high, as it sits at around 56%. Secondly, what is important to note is that the vast majority of this trade, around 80 to 90 percent, is actually done with partners outside of Africa. In fact, Africa's three most important trading partners are the EU, China and the US, and intra-African trade is actually very small, at around 10 to 20 percent. Finally, what is Africa trading? Well, if you cast your eyes to the map on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see that the vast majority of Africa, in fact, 90% of African economies are resource dependent. So they are trading things such as iron ore, platinum, gold, oil, and agricultural produce. So how did coronavirus come to impact all of this? Well, if you recall all those sub triggers that I had highlighted in the World Economic Forum survey uh, on slide two of my presentation, Coronavirus actually triggered a whole lot of those supply chain disruptions. First and foremost, it resulted in a unique situation where we had a twin shock to global demand and supply at the global level. As a result of this, global trade values declined by around 3% in the first quarter before accelerating to a decline of around 27% in the second quarter. 
COVID-19 also resulted in other supply chain disruptions through commodity price fluctuations, export-import restrictions and shortages of labour. When assessing how this impacted Africa, we need to look at how it impacted Africa's most important trading partners, and this was felt in three waves. First and foremost, from China, secondly, from OECD economies, but specifically the EU, and finally, from within, as Africa itself eventually went into lockdown. So let's begin by looking at that first wave and the effect from China. As we know, the coronavirus originated in China, and China was the first economy to go into lockdown. As a result of its own lockdown, China's GDP contracted by around 6.8% in the first quarter of this year, and this of course had a direct knock-on effect on its trading relationship with Africa, where over the first quarter we saw a drop of around 14% in China-Africa trade. Now I indicated in the previous slide that China is Africa's second most important trading partner, but for some countries it is the most important trading partner. And I've listed those countries up on the screen for you. For these countries, China is their main export market, and I've also indicated what good they are mainly exporting to China. And in all instances, you will see that these are primary commodities. We're talking about fuel, we're talking about metals, raw materials, etc. And this is a good opportunity for me to talk about the second effect that coronavirus had on supply chain disruptions this year, and that is, of course, the drop in commodity prices. Between January and April, we saw a drop in, uh, in the price of all commodities with the exception of gold. And of course, the oil price was the most significant in that regard. So for a country like South Sudan, for example, where 95 or so percent of its exports go to China, and 99% of that is oil, it was not just affected by shocks to demand and supply as a result of coronavirus, but it was significantly affected by the drop in the price of its main export good, which was of course oil. Turning our attention to the second wave, we need to look at the impact on supply chains as a result of the lockdown in OECD economies this year. After China went into lockdown in the first quarter, we know that a whole host of other economies followed suit. These included the likes of Japan, South Korea, which remain uh, key centers of global value chains, as well as the Eurozone and the US, which are, of course, some of Africa's most important trading partners. Focusing specifically on Europe, because the Eurozone is Africa's number one trading partner, we know that as a result of its own lockdown, its economy contracted by around 14.4%, and over the course of the entire year, it is expected to go into a recession of around 7.5%. This, of course, is going to impact its trading relationship with Africa, and it is going to hit some countries harder than others. Up on the screen, like I did with China, I've listed for you those countries for which the Eurozone is their primary export market. What is interesting here is that we have a much more diverse or mature trading relationship. Africa is not just exporting primary commodities to Europe, but they're exporting things such as consumer goods, uh, and we even have transportation coming in there as well. So where in the first quarter we saw a real knock-on effect from the coronavirus in terms of primary commodities and trading relationships with China, as the Eurozone went into a lockdown, we saw this impact widen to affect a whole host of other goods and services that Africa had to offer. Finally, we need to look at the effect on supply chains as a result of Africa's own lockdown. Now, Africa moved into a lockdown very quickly. If you cast your attention to the map closest to you on the screen, this was developed by ex-Africa at the end of March, and it, it shows to you the extent of the lockdown at that time. In fact, the vast majority in almost all countries across the continent had some sort of border closure or travel restriction. Fast forward a couple of months and the map on the right hand side of the screen demonstrates to you the extent of the lockdown in Africa at the end of May. Throughout the course of June, in fact, 43 countries still had their borders closed. 35 of them were still implementing some sort of nighttime curfew. And in seven countries, there were still international air traffic closures. So as we are sitting here today, the vast majority of Africa still remains in some sort of lockdown. 
This, of course, has affected supply chains even further. On the one hand, it has affected Africa's ability to export and import from its most important trading partners across the rest of the world, even as they start to open up their economies. But secondly, it has also impacted intra-African trade. Now, while I indicated that the share of intra-African trade as a percentage of total trade in Africa is very low at around 10 to 20 percent, it is nevertheless an important source of income for a vast majority of the continent. In fact, the most impacted form of trade as a result of the coronavirus has been the effect on informal trade, where we have communities trading agricultural produce and mineral resources across borders. The second most impacted good as a result of the coronavirus and the lockdown in Africa is actually manufactured goods, as manufactured goods are the second most traded goods in Africa. Of course, if we had to talk about the impact on trade in Africa as a result of the coronavirus, we would have to talk about the biggest fatality, which was the failed launch of the Continental Free Trade Agreement on the 1st of July this year. As a result of the coronavirus, the expected launch date has now been pushed to the 1st of January 2021, although it remains highly unlikely that we will be able to reach that deadline as well. So what is the effect of all of this been? Well, it is estimated that as a result of the coronavirus, African trade is going to drop by at least 35% in 2020 to the tune of around 270 billion US dollars. Now, it's important to recall here that I noted that 56% of African GDP is derived from trade. So as a result of this drop in trade, as a, in addition to a whole host of other effects from coronavirus, such as a loss in investment and a loss in remittances, the African continent is expected to tip into recession for the first time this year in 25 years. And that is demonstrated to you on the right hand side of the screen. The extent of this recession, of course, is not known, as it will depend on how long lockdowns persist and how quickly individual economies are able to bounce back. But it is estimated that Africa will go into a recession of around 2 to 5 percent this year. In the bottom left hand corner of the screen, what I have for you are, the, are those countries that are expected to be the most impacted in this regard. We have the bottom performers in terms of GDP this year. And we have a whole host of African economies here. We have small island states that are heavily dependent on tourism, for example, such as the Seychelles and Mauritius. We have a whole host of southern African countries that are going to be affected by the, the recession in South Africa, such as Lesotho and Botswana and Zimbabwe. And secondly, of, and thirdly, of course, we have commodity dependent countries and specifically countries that are dependent on oil as they have not only been affected by the shocks to demand and supply, but they have also been affected by the drop in the oil price this year. And that includes the likes of Equatorial Guinea and Sudan. Having had a look at our first source of disruption, specifically an environmental disruption this year in the form of the coronavirus pandemic, let's now turn our attention to geopolitical triggers of disruption. In this section of the presentation, I'm going to look at disruption through political and security events, such as elections, regional political disputes, and through security incidents, whether criminal or conflict related. Before looking at the specific threats, what I want to do is take a minute and take a look at country risk in Africa from ex-Africa's perspective. What I have up on the screen are our latest country risk scores for every single country in Africa. Our country risk scores are derived by taking into account a whole host of political, security and economic factors. What should jump out at you is the fact that the vast majority of African countries this year are being classified as high to severe risk. This is a first for us at Ex Africa and is directly related to coronavirus as coronavirus is itself causing country risk to go up in Africa. And if you are interested in learning more about this, we have another webcast that you can watch and please do get in touch with us about that. But outside of coronavirus, there are a number of political and security threats that persist in Africa that could, could, could continue to pose a threat to supply chains. First and foremost, we have found that changes in political power in Africa, whether through elections or through some incident 
of political violence can result in supply chain disruptions in the form of border delays, border closures, or internet blackouts. Last year, for example, there were a number of case studies that we could point to where incidents of political violence resulted in some form of supply chain disruption. In January 2019, for example, Equatorial Guinea closed its border with Cameroon over perceived coup threats from across the border. Similarly, in April 2019, Sudan closed all of its land borders with its neighbors as the country had an insurrection at the time and as the military moved to overthrow President Omar al-Bashir. Over the past six months and six to 12 months, we've seen border closures and internet blackouts taking place during the normal hosting of elections. In February 2020, for example, and as Togo went to host its presidential elections, it closed its land borders with its neighbors and it also instituted an internet blackout. This is quite common for West African states. Similarly, last month, as Burundi went to host its presidential elections, it also moved to, uh, to implement an internet blackout in the country. We've also seen supply chain disruptions come about from non-state actors in a particular country. In Malawi, for example, in August 2019, it was anti-government protesters who threatened to shut down the country's borders for three days over grievances related to the incumbent at the time. Of course, Malawi moved to host peaceful elections just this month, but its borders nevertheless remained closed. On the one hand, this was related to the coronavirus pandemic, but of course it was also related to the fact that they were hosting very crucial elections in the country. The main takeaway here is that as countries move to implement some sort of change in political power, either through elections, whether they be free and fair or not, or through some incident related to political violence, such as an insurrection or a coup, supply chains are likely to be disrupted, disrupted either in the form of a border delay, border closure, or internet blackout. In addition to elections, we've seen supply chain disruptions come about in Africa as a result of political disputes between neighbors. There are a number of case studies that we can point to where we've had long-running disputes that have resulted in the long-term closure of borders. The border between Morocco and Algeria, for example, has been closed for about 25 years, relating initially to a security incident at the time. Similarly, the border between Eritrea and Ethiopia has been closed since the late 1990s. The border was partially opened in September 2018 as relations between the two countries thawed at the time, but during that year, Eritrea moved unilaterally to close the border again, and it remains closed today. In addition to these long-running disputes, we've seen over the course of the past 18 months, some isolated incidents emerge as well. In, in February 2019, for example, Rwanda unilaterally closed its border with Uganda over perceived threats from across the border at the time. Despite numerous gatherings and numerous attempts to try and get that border to open up again, including a virtual conference in the beginning of June 2020, the border continues to remain shut today. Similarly, in August 2019, Nigeria unilaterally closed its border with Benin, citing the smuggling of primary commodities at the time. While Nigeria indicated that it would open its border in January 2020 this year, that border continues to remain shut today as well. The final source of supply chain disruption that I would like to talk about in my presentation has to do with security incidents, whether in the form of crime or as a result of conflict. And when looking at this, we have to look at direct and targeted attacks or indirect effects on supply chains. So beginning with direct and targeted attacks in the left-hand corner of the screen, we need to look at the impact on the logistics sector in Africa. Looking at conflict, for example, across Africa's conflict zones, we have seen attacks taking place against ports, whether airports or shipping ports, as these remain strategic assets for militant groups as well as state groups. In Libya, for example, we have seen multiple attacks against the country's airports as Khalifa Haftar continued his siege against Tripoli from April 2019. Criminal incidents also tend to target the logistics sector. Looking at South Africa, for example, Human Rights Watch came out and indicated 
that between March 2018 and September 2019, over 200 foreign truck drivers were killed in xenophobic violence in the country. Of course, if we are looking at direct attacks against the logistics sector, we have to talk about maritime piracy. And here we need to look at the Gulf of Guinea, which for a number of years has remained the global piracy hotspot. In fact, 40% of piracy incidents across the world took place in the Gulf of Guinea last year. Now, while the vast majority of these incidents comprise kidnappings and of course pose a risk to crew members, all vessel hijackings globally last year also took place in this region. Turning our attention to the right-hand side of the screen, we also need to consider how security incidents, whether criminal or conflict-related, could result in indirect effects. Looking at crime, for example, xenophobic violence, in addition to the direct effects that I've spoken about, can also result in indirect consequences through border delays. In March 2019, as xenophobic violence was reported in South Africa, for example, the border between South Africa and Mozambique was closed for a period, and the picture of that is demonstrated in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Terrorism can also result in border closures, where in July 2019, Kenya moved to close its border with Somalia over the threat posed by Al-Shabaab in the country. Even organized crime can result in border closures and border delays, where in September 2019, Sudan moved to close its border with Libya and the Central African Republic over vehicle smuggling in the region. This now brings me to the end of my presentation, and we of course have covered a lot of ground, so what I want to do is highlight some key takeaways for the audience. First and foremost, in, in terms of the environmental trigger in the form of COVID-19, I think it's important to take away the fact that the vast majority of African countries continue to remain in some sort of lockdown today, as of the 30th of June. As these economies open up and potentially as the virus continues to surge across the continent, it's unlikely that we're going to see nationwide lockdowns again, but supply chain managers should expect to see some sort of targeted shutdown uh, going forward, whether that is in specific sectors or within specific locations. Finally, I think it's important to keep in mind the long-term effects of the coronavirus in Africa, specifically the fact that Africa is going to tip into recession for the first time this year in 25 years. This, of course, is going to affect long-term demand. Turning to geopolitical triggers, I think it's important to bear in mind the fact that 22 African countries were expected to go to the polls this year and 18 next year. Now, a number of these elections have been delayed to later this year or to next year, and what this means is that over the course of the next 18 months, the vast majority of African countries are going to head to the polls, and this, of course, is going to result in supply chain disruption. The extent of such disruption will depend on the economy at hand and how free that country is. In some countries, you're going to have disruptions that could last a couple of days. In other countries, we have seen internet blackouts lasting months. Turning to the political disputes that I highlighted in my presentation, it is unlikely that these disputes, specifically between Rwanda and Uganda and between Nigeria and Benin, are going to be resolved this year, as borders are likely to remain closed as a result of these disputes, but also because of the coronavirus. Finally, turning to the threat posed by security incidents, whether criminal or conflict-related in Africa, I would continue to pay close attention to the conflict zones in Africa, specifically in Libya, the Sahel, Central Africa, Somalia and the Gulf of Guinea. These are your more established conflict zones in Africa and I would expect direct and indirect consequences on supply chains in these regions. But going forward, I would increasingly pay attention to emerging conflict zones in Africa. These include the Mozambican crisis in the northern regions of the country, the threat posed to West African coastal states as a result of militancy in the Sahel, and the potential for piracy in the Mozambican channel over the long term, particularly as LNG starts to come on board. All of the intelligence that I've provided for you today is available on X Africa's Insight platform. If you do not have a subscription to our platform, please do get in touch with us to set up a two-week free trial. We would be happy to assist. I'd also like to flag that X Africa provides open access to COVID-19 content and its relationship with country risk in Africa. So please do visit our website for that as well.
This now brings me to the end of my presentation. If you have any comments or queries, please don't hesitate to email us at insight at xafrica.com. I thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation and all of our insights. Please stay safe and keep well.